Now that we've had a look at the class of recursive functions, we're going to look at the functions which are outside that class, non-recursive functions. We'll start with three different reasons why there are functions which aren't recursive. We'll first look at an argument by enumeration, then we'll give a diagonalization argument, and finally, after that, we'll look at a few examples of non-recursive functions that we can explicitly define. We'll start with the enumeration argument. The first fact is that there are only countably many recursive functions from numbers to numbers. Each recursive function has got a description of how it's built up from the basic functions by the constructors. We can enumerate those descriptions, and so we can enumerate the recursive functions that those descriptions describe. So there's countably many recursive functions. But we already know that there are uncountably many functions from numbers to numbers. That's obvious. Every bit stream determines a function from numbers to just the numbers 0 and 1. And so since there's uncountably many bit streams, there's got to be uncountably many functions. You could show this directly by diagonalization, just by showing that if you had an enumeration of all of the functions, then diagonalization would give you a, a, a function which wasn't on that enumeration. So it couldn't be an enumeration of all of the functions. So they've got to be non-recursive functions because there's countably many recursive functions and uncountably many functions. So there's plenty of non-recursive functions which should lead you to ask, well, what are they like? Could we have some examples of non-recursive functions? Well, one particular example of a non-recursive function we can get pretty directly by examining a diagonalization argument. We know that there are countably many total recursive functions from numbers to numbers. So we could enumerate them, f0, f1, f2, f3, etc. That's an enumeration of the functions from numbers to numbers. And then we could define this very particular function, which I'll call f star, by setting f star of n to be the nth function on my list applied to the number n and add 1. That's clearly a function from numbers to numbers. And just as clearly, it's not on the list, because if it were on the list somewhere, say as fm, then we look at fm applied to m. fm applied to m would have to be fm applied to m plus 1, and no number is equal to itself plus 1, so it can't be equal to fm for any number m. So this is not a recursive function. It's an example of a non-recursive function. But that doesn't really tell us very much about what this function f star is like, because its nature depends on the enumeration of the total recursive functions that we had. And I've told you nothing about how to enumerate those functions. A different ordering would give you a different uh, function f star, which isn't on the list. There's nothing really intrinsically special about f star, except that it's just an example of a non-recursive function defined in terms of this enumeration. Now, before we go on to another way of looking for particular non-recursive functions, it's helpful to think about why this argument doesn't work if I was enumerating all of the partial recursive functions as well as the total recursive functions, those functions which uh, are encoded by re uh, register machines that don't always terminate, which don't always return a value, here, I can just as easily enumerate them, there's still countably many of them, and I could define f star uh, by saying that f star of n is now f of n applied to n plus 1, and now we can see why that is not necessarily a function which isn't on the list, because if f of n happens to be undefined at input n, then this right-hand side here is undefined, the left-hand side is undefined, and an undefined number plus 1 is also undefined. So we've got no reason to think that this diagonal of this function is not also on the list. So this diagonalization only works for uh, diagonalizing out of the collection of total recursive functions to tell us that there's a total non-recursive function. Now, 
Our first example of a non-recursive function that's kind of interesting and tells us something interesting about uh, what can't be computed is the halting function. So to understand what the halting function is, think about the issue of when it is that a register machine halts or terminates on a given input. That's a fact that we might really be interested in knowing. You've all had the experience of uh, sitting in front of a computer and the computer just sort of locks up and you don't know whether it's doing some kind of long computation and it's just not returning control to you in the user interface and it's just doing some computing and will come back to you after a while or whether it's just stuck and will never come back to you. Uh, this is a general issue. Uh, sometimes we are interested in, is this program sort of locked up in a loop or is it going to terminate after some, some period of time? This is what's called the halting problem. And what we'll show is that there's no way to uh, calculate in advance whether a computer is going to halt or not in every circumstance in the following sense. Think of register machines, and now because the collection of regi register machines is countable, let's enumerate all of the register machines on some enumeration. So we'll let Rn be the nth machine on my list. So every register machine program occurs somewhere on the list. There's countably many of them. We'll define the halting function to be this two input function h we'll say that h applied to n and m returns one, true, if you like, if the register machine with code n halts when it started with the input m. And it will return zero if that register machine doesn't halt on the input m. So we're just encoding with a yes or a no, or a one or a zero in this case, whether the machine number n halts when it's given an input of m. So some machines will, like the division function that we saw before, will not halt when it's given an input of zero, and it will halt when it's given other inputs. So whether or not it terminates might depend on the input. And so we check the machine and the particular input, and this function is saying yes or no. So this is a mathematical function. Uh, it's just a function from pairs of numbers to numbers. And the question is, is that something that we could compute? Is it a recursive function? We're going to prove that this can't be a recursive function. Here's why. If it were recursive, then this function would be recursive too, which is a simpler function, g, which is now only a partial function from numbers to numbers, where g of n is zero if h of n and n is zero. So it's just applying h to the same two inputs, n and n. It's diagonalizing on h, just looking at the diagonal of its inputs, where the left input and the right input are the same. And so it just calculates h of n and n, and that's g of n, at least in the zero case. But if h of n and n is one, then we'll say that g of n is undefined. And so you could imagine if you had a register machine that calculates h, it would be very easy to have a register machine that calculates g. You just uh, take the first uh, register and duplicate it, whatever is in it, into the second register, and then run the machine for h. Check the output. If it's zero, you terminate. And if the output isn't zero, you just get stuck in a loop. And that will calculate g for you. So if h is recursive, so is g. But if g is recursive, then a register machine must compute it. And because we've listed all of the register machines, it must be somewhere on the list. So I'll call that register machine, register machine m for some number. So there must be register machine m that computes g. But now you might see the problem. Let's calculate little g of m. g of m is undefined if h of m and m is 1, which just means that rm 
halts on the input of M. So let me explain both of these steps. G of M is undefined if and only if H of M and M is one, because that's the meaning of G. That's how we define G. G is undefined, G of M is undefined when H of M and M is one, okay? But H of M and M is one if and only if register machine M halts on the input of M. That's the definition of H. Okay, but look at this. That can't work because G is meant to be computed by R of M. So G of M is undefined if and only if R of M doesn't halt on the input of M. That's what it is to say that R of M computes H. So these two things directly clash with each other. This says G of M is undefined if and only if the register machine halts on the input. And this says G of M is undefined if and only if the register machine doesn't halt on the input. Those two things contradict each other. Because we've got this contradiction, uh, we have got to blame that on something. The only assumption that we made to blame this on is the assumption that H was a recursive function. That's the only assumption we've made. And so uh, G isn't recursive. So H isn't recursive because um, H being recursive means that G has to be recursive. So this was the assumption that we made. The halting function is not recursive. There is no way that we can compute with a register machine or with any computing device uh, an answer to the question, does this register machine halt on this input? This is our first concrete, interesting example of a non-recursive function. The halting function is not recursive. Let's give another example of a non-recursive function. And this time, it's not going to depend at all on any enumeration of the recursive functions or the register machines. This is what's called the busy beaver function. And it relies on the fact that there's only finitely many register machines with n instructions in the instruction set. It's very easy to see there's only very few register machines with just one instruction. Uh, there's a few more register machines where there's two instructions, because you can choose two increments, two decrements, increment and a decrement, um, depending on the same register or different registers, and so on. But there's only finitely many at each stage, at least if you imagine numbering the registers one, two, three, four. So given this fact, we can reason like this. Each register machine with n instructions either hangs, doesn't terminate, on an input where we have give it n as its input, or those register machines terminate with some result in the first register. We'll define b of n to be the largest number that is computed by a register machine with n instructions when it's given an input of n. This is a function, a total function from numbers to numbers. It is purely precisely defined. There's only finitely many n instruction register machines. Each of them, uh, when given an input of n, either terminate or they don't on that input. Of course, we can't calculate whether they terminate or not in general, but there's only finitely many of these things. Either they do terminate or they don't. You just wait and see. And uh, of those ones that do terminate, because there's only finitely many that do, uh, there's a largest number that they compute, uh, that, they, that they leave in the first register. So let the largest among those be b of n. This function b cannot be computed by a register machine. This is what's called the busy beaver function. Here's why it can't be computed by a register machine. If there were, some register machine would compute it, and so would this function be computed, uh, the composition of the successor function and the b function. Uh, if b is recursive, so is this function. But how many instructions would a register machine that computed this function have? Uh, if it were computable, it's computable by some register machine. So Let's say it's computed by a register machine with M instructions. 
then on the input of m, this machine calculates b of m plus 1, which is one more than can be computed by any register machine with m instructions, so that's impossible. So this function, the composition of successor and b, is not computable, it's not a recursive function, and so neither is b. So b is a very special function because it grows faster than any recursive function. Uh, it calculates a larger number at each stage uh, than any recursive function can do in general. Now, to give you some sense of how fast growing the busy beaver function must be, I'll give you an example of a recursive function, which is actually a very fast growing function itself. It's called the Ackermann function. It's defined by a double recursion, uh, which means in this case it's a recursive function, but it's not primitive recursive. We define it like this uh, it's a two place function, and a of 0 and n is n plus 1. A of m plus 1 and 0 is A of m and 1, and A of m plus 1 and n plus 1 is A of m, and then in the second input we place A of m plus 1 and n. This is a recursive function, but it's a sensor which is only just a recursive function, and it grows very, very quickly. A of 0 and n is just n plus 1. It's just the successor of function. That's how it was uh, defined just here. But if we replace the first input by now, a of 1 and n is n plus 2, because a of 1 and 0 is a of 0 and 1, which is 1 plus 1, which indeed is 0 plus 2. And a of 1 and n plus 1 is a of 0 and a of 1 and n, which indeed turns out to be n plus 2. And if you do the same sort of reasoning, you'll see that a of 2 of n becomes 2n plus 3, then a of 3 and n becomes 2 to the power of n plus 3 minus 3, and a to the 4 and n becomes staggeringly large. Um, that's a tower of n plus 3 2s here in this power of power of power of power of power of power of 2. And then um, after that, it gets seriously big. Um, a of 4 and 2 already has 19,729 digits when you write it out as a decimal number. And after that, the numbers get ginormous. This is a massively fast-growing function. Now, you might wonder what all this function stuff uh, about numbers and things has got to do with logic. We're going to apply this by looking back and thinking about the notion of being recursive or being calculatable. We're going to apply this to logic problems rather than things like the computation problems, like the halting problem. Uh, we're going to look at questions of, is there a way to decide whether or not an argument is valid? Now, we can already see we could enumerate all of the arguments, and so we could represent this as a question about deciding whether a function which, given a number which represents an argument, is this yes or no, uh, well, is there going to be a function which calculates a yes or no answer to the question, is this a valid argument, or is this a number which represents a valid argument? The question, is that function recursive, is now a question that we could ask. So we're going to convert issues of uh, classifying arguments or classifying formulas or propositions or other kinds of problems that we might want to solve, we're going to convert them into questions about numbers because then we could apply the, the technology of classifying functions as recursive or not uh, to those problems. So here's this general way that we convert things into function talk we'll say that a set of numbers, in the first instance, is a recursive set if the function, which we call the characteristic function of that set, which is just the yes, no, one, zero function, saying uh, of an input value, will return uh, one if the input value is in the set and return zero otherwise. So it's just this function which you feed it in a number and it says 1 if the function was in the set. 
that we were uh, interested in classifying and zero otherwise. And so we'll say that that set is recursive if there is a way that we can calculate or compute this function. If this function is a recursive function, that means there is a way of calculating or computing whether or not, that's the one or zero, uh, for whether this object is in that set. And so it turns out that some sets are going to be recursive. Some sets, we've got a way of deciding whether or not you remember in a, in a recursive function, computable sort of way. And there'll be other sets that are so complicated that we can't do that. Now, that's one way that you could connect up a set with uh, the idea of a function. That's the characteristic function which classifies membership of the set. But there's another way that we could connect functions up with sets, and that's, we've already seen this when we've enumerated uh, a set. Uh, a set is enumerated if we've got a function from numbers into that set, uh, which is, which enumerates all of those members of that set, which leaves nothing out. It's a subjective function uh, onto that set. Well, if the function which does that is recursive, we'll call this a recursively enumerable set. A set is recursively enumerable if there's some recursive total function e such that those elements e0, e1, e2, e3, etc. enumerates all of the members of x. So a, a, a set is recursively enumerable if you've got this little function which, if you like, spits out members of the set. This is a way that you could compute that set in the sense of producing all of the members. So we've got two different ways of thinking about whether or not a set is sort of connected to the recursive functions. There's the, it's a recursive set in the sense that it's got a recursive characteristic function. Given a number, we could decide, are you in the set or not? And then we've got this recursive enumeration sense where the objects in the set can be enumerated by this function. And there's a question as to whether uh, these two notions are related to each other. Well, it turns out that if the set is recursive, it's, if its characteristic rec uh, uh, function is recursive, then it's recursively enumerable. Uh, why? Well, you can think about that for a minute. Pause this if you haven't come up with an answer, because very soon I'm going to give you the answer as to why. So now that you've come back, you've either thought of the answer or you've got stuck, here is why. So suppose I've got a recursive set. Uh, call the set x, and it's got a characteristic function fx, which, when given an input, I'll call it n. Uh, f of n is 1 if n is in x, and f of n is 0 otherwise. Well, here's a way that I could imagine programming a computer to enumerate the members of x. What I do is I just think of all of the numbers one by one, and I just imagine these numbers coming off an assembly line, and I apply fx to 0, and I apply fx to 1, and this is a recursive total function, and so I've got some code which does that, so, and I'm applying this to each of the members, and if the uh, function applies to a number and returns 1, I let that number pass through, and I spit it out in my enumeration. And if the number is 0, if it turns out to say, let's say fx of 1 uh, is 0, then I delete this number from my enumeration. And maybe 2 is in, and 3 is out, and maybe 4 is out, and 5 is in, and so on. This is the core idea. I can imagine programming a a function to do the enumeration just by doing this process again and again and again and again. Imagine I've got this big loop and I want to know what the nth uh, number is that I enumerate. Well, I consider the numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, and I 
see the answer, yes or no, yes or no, and I just keep track of how many are in, and eventually, if I get up to the nth uh, one, I'll say, here's the nth one in my enumeration. There's a little bit more uh, to do to explain how this works, but this will give you a hint of how we could use the characteristic function to define an enumeration of my set. But not all recursively enumerable sets are recursive. You can't go in reverse. And there's a reason for this. We've already seen an example of a non-recursive set of numbers. That's the set of numbers n, where the register machine rn halts on an input of n. That's not a recursive set, because if it were recursive, we'd solve the halting problem. But it turns, that, it turns out that we can enumerate this set. And we could do it in a similar sort of way to the way that we did before. Imagine what we do is we get register machine zero and start it running on input zero, and then get register machine one and start it running on input one and register machine. And eventually one of these is gonna halt maybe. And if it does halt, we uh, put this on our list. We put the number that it, it, it was, uh, you know, maybe it's register machine five. When that halts, we put it on our list and uh, then we look at the next one so far. There's only finitely many running at any time. And so we can devote some time to each of them. And the next one that halts, we put it on the list and then we throw that register machine away and we keep doing this. Anything that halts will eventually halt. And so we can add it to the list. Those things that keep running, we never need to know whether they keep running or not because they're just going to keep running. We never need to say, ah, oh, that's not going to halt. We just keep it around, and we keep on trying the next one and trying the next one and trying the next one. We'll eventually get to, for, for each halting one, we'll eventually get to it, and we'll eventually add it to our enumeration. And the ones which don't halt, they just keep, uh, keep hanging around. Uh, so we can recursively enumerate all of the... Uh, numbers of halting uh, recursive halting register machines, uh, but there's no way that we could decide whether or not something was one of those. And so we've got this kind of two-sided or one-sided notion of uh, decidability, as it were. There's things which, if they're true, we can know that they are true, like this thing halts. And it's, it turns out that for anything that halts, it's knowable that it halts. Uh, but that does not mean that for anything that doesn't halt, it's knowable that it doesn't. This is the difference between things that are recursively enumerable, which is sort of one side knowable, and those other things which are knowable whether or not they are true, like uh, things which we've got recursive characteristic functions for. Now, this distinction is really important in what follows, because it turns out that provability sounds like it's one of these things. If something is provable, then there is a proof for it somewhere. So that's the kind of thing that at least in principle we could know, because a proof is just a finite thing. We could stumble across it and verify it. Maybe it's really, really large, but given enough time, we could verify that proof. However, things that are not provable, they've got counterexamples, but sometimes the counterexamples might be infinite and we might not ever be able to verify in some finite amount of time that this is a counterexample. So it sounds like provability is one of these concepts which is recursively enumerable, but maybe not recursive. Maybe it's the kind of truce which we can know if true, but not know whether or not. Now that's the intuitive idea, and we've got some idea of how that might formally apply and how we could prove that some things have got this kind of nature. Some concepts can be knowable on one side, but not knowable whether or not in 
the last part of this course, we will show indeed that logical notions like provability, uh, validity, uh, truth in uh, arithmetic or truth in logic, those sorts of concepts are exactly like this too. And we will formally prove that they are to really get a stronger sense of the power of what we can know in logic, but also what its limits might be. But that's for the last part of the course. So we finished this little tour of computability for this, this part. So uh, for this section, the things that you need to know is that since there are uncountably many functions and countably many computable functions, there have to be uncomputable functions. And then how you can prove particular functions to be uncomputable by diagonalization, by the halting problem, and the busy beaver uh, function. And then uh, these final concepts of characteristic functions and recursive enumerability, they're going to be the things that we will carry forward from this and apply uh, to questions of uh, the, the power and the limits of logical notions.